Well, g'day, folks. This is One Legends with Bevo you don't want to miss. I'm going to be chatting to a shark survivor, so stick around. This is going to be an absolute ripper. This is Legends with Bevo. Thanks to Anytime Fitness Glenelg, Renalake Electrical Services. And now, here's your host, Bevo. Welcome to Facebook Live Legends with Bevo. And tonight, I'm joined by a man who has come up close and personal with a great white shark. His name is Chris Blows. He's also an author of Court Inside. Chris, great to have you on Legends with Bevo. No worries, Bevo. Thanks for having me. We got there in the end, didn't we? We did, yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think we tried about 20 times. Yeah, to, uh, to get, <laughs> finally got there. But uh, busy times, that's all we... Uh, we got, got there in the end. That's the most important. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, before we get to the incident, uh, which you've spoken about obviously many a time, uh, let's firstly start about yourself, your journey. You grew up as an Adelaide Hills boy. Played footy for Onkers, and we probably played against each other because I played for Birdwood. Yeah. Um, and then you made the the big move over to Air Peninsula. You loved your surfing, your camping. Um, yeah, tell us more about your journey. Yeah, so like I said, like you said uh, I grew up in Woodside in Adelaide Hills. Um, had a pretty typical childhood. Um, grew up loving footy, cricket. Um, loved playing a bit of golf. And every summer holidays, we'd go down to Port Elliot and stay down there at a shack and that's when at about 15 years old, that's when I started to get into surfing and fell in love with it straight away. Um, after I finished school, I followed my now wife, Chloe over to the Air Peninsula. She got a teaching job over there at Cummins and I followed her over there obviously. And, um, yeah, moved over there, continued to play footy and, and over there, the, the waves are unreal and the beach is unreal. And we spent, Pretty much every weekend going up and down that west coast of SA from like Port Lincoln up to Sejuna, um, around to Cactus Beach, just exploring coastline and, and finding new ways to surf. And that's pretty much how I pictured doing what I love doing for the rest of my life every weekend. So, yeah. And 2015, Anzac Day, you went and did the, the dawn service with your mates and I thought, all right, perfect day for a surf. Um, the, the waves are looking good. And then obviously it all sort of went to shit, but tell us more about it. Tell us about the day. Yeah. Well, yeah, as you said, we, we got up and went for dawn service really early. Um, Nick, one of my good mates who I surf with, his, um, dad, uh, went to Vietnam. So it was really like important thing to get up for him to get up and he got us up as well. And, and, uh, cause we were up so early, we went, decided to go for a surf out at, um, a spot known as Fisheries Bay. Um, it's about 35 K Southwest of Fort Lincoln town center. Um, and we'd been surfing for probably an hour, I reckon. And I decided to get one more wave. I, I was just down the channel and I, I decided to get one more wave before I paddle in. And I was almost back at the suck rock, um, uh, when I was hit from the side, which felt like being hit by a truck at the time. And yes, yeah, soon realized I was being attacked by a five meter white shark. Gee whiz. Uh, um, you mentioned it felt like being hit by a truck, um, and you know, five meters, that's just absolutely massive. Uh, I, what was that sort of feeling? You know, obviously no doubt fear, but yeah, give us a bit more of an understanding about sort of what happened, Chris. Oh, it was instant shock, obviously. And, you know, my scream sent everyone instantly scrambling for the rocks, um, including my two good mates, Nick and Brock. Um, I don't think anyone there will ever forget that scream, you know. Um, and they, yeah, obviously realized straight away it was a shark and, you know, had had my left flank, the underside of my board and, and my left flank, and it was just shaking me around like a rag doll. And that feeling of, you know, it was such a big shark that I just felt so small and so powerless. And, you know, it shook me around for a bit until it let go of me. I was then off my board and my two good mates, Nick and Brock, realized it was me and they were starting to paddle back out to come help me. And I would have got within an arm's reach of Nick, went to go reach out and the boys, you could, they felt this, they, they have this image burn their mind. They felt this surge of water and they instantly knew it was a shark. Um, and then the shark come up behind me and, and Nick remembers the, you know, the senses on its nose and its eyes rolling back into head before it bit me and pulled me down for the second time. So the second time I had, had my left leg and I was now under the ocean surface sort of fighting for my life as it was just dragging me through the water. And you mentioned before Nick and Brock, you know, incredible bravery shown there, which that, which naturally you do for your best mate. And and there was also you know ten or fifteen surfers there on the day, and and you sort of mentioned it in your book and in other interviews as well that that's quite a lot of surfers 
it's not always that many people there. And, yeah. and there was a number of people that sort of helped you out on the day. I think because it was Anzac Day, it, and it was a Saturday, by the way. But yeah, it's it's it's. I think it was so busy too. It was um, the only spot to surf that day as well. So, and that's pretty much where all the local Lincoln crew go. But I was very lucky that there was that many people there, you know. So, one of the guys that watched the attack happen. By the time Nick and Brock got me into shore, um, you know, I was, you know, they 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 had to get on either side of me, and and they virtually just frog leap frog leap me to shore because my, my it took my leg in the water. So. I was amputated, you know, I had the initial bite mark on my left leg and then I was amputated above my knee, the left leg. And, um, you know, you can imagine I was losing lots of blood. So one of the guys that was, was watching at the cliff had his leg rope already off his board and they tied that around my stump while I was still in the water. And doctors say if they that went on a minute later, I would have bled to death 100%. So... That's just quite phenomenal and, and, you know, a credit to all the people that were there to help you on the day. And, and speaking of helping the paramedics, um, they saved your life as well because you went in and out of consciousness and um, you had to be carried up 150 stairs. Is that correct? And yeah, not only 150 stairs. You know, I was at the bottom of a cliff. I was like 35 kilometres from the nearest hospital and I was 650 kilometres from the nearest trauma centre in Adelaide. So to be honest, that, at that stage, I knew I was in serious trouble. And, um, I actually thought that was going to be the end of my life. You know, all those thoughts come to my head that I was only, you know, 26 years old and I was never going to get to see Chloe ever again. I was never going to get to see my family ever again. And all those thoughts come rushing to your head. Um, and yeah, it's not a nice feeling, but they managed to get me across those rocks, um, while slipping in and out of consciousness and up 150 stairs, um, not just a straight flight of stairs either. I think there was like five or six landings. And, you know, I just remember how well they work as a team. They they were jumping over me at every interval and, and talking to each other and just, just trying to stay positive and keep me awake. But by the time I'd got to the top of the stairs and into the back of Nick's Land Cruiser, which was already waiting, you know, I was, I was out. And um, I think we got 11 kilometers down the road and we met the ambulance. The ambulance opened the back door and, you know, I was laying in there completely lifeless, you know, it's as white as a sheet of paper and, and the paramedics honestly thought they were too late. And, and the paramedics, um, there was, there was three paramedics there, uh, two were doing CPR and, and one was driving it. And you mentioned that that's not always the case normally. No, nah, that's not. Um, and Ben, the driver has a bit of local knowledge as well. Um, growing up surfing that area as well. So it was very lucky. He knew exactly where to go. So on their on their trek out to me, there was no wrong turns and he knew the road, which, you know, helped. And while he drove, two paramedics were able to do CPR in the back while under transport. And they don't, they don't recommend that, um, at all because it's, you got two unrestrained paramedics in the back. Um, it just becomes too unsafe. So, but they just, they made, they went against their protocol and they decided to do that, which ultimately ended up helped saving my life. So, and you've no doubt caught out with these, caught up these paramedics since the incident. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They they did an amazing job. They just little things like they they don't carry blood on the ambulance, so all they they put like an IV drip into me, and they kept any little bit of blood I had in my system going around, and that kept that brain function, um, which is what I needed to not have brain damage on for having sustained CPR for so long. And from the ambulance, uh, you were flown by the Royal Flying Doctor Service to Adelaide. Is that correct? Yeah, I think um, once they'd stabilised me in the Port Lincoln Hospital, so yeah, my CPR started at 10 a.m. when the ambulance picked me up and it didn't stop till 11.15 a.m., so that's an hour and 15 minutes of CPR. And in that Jeez. time, I think I had eight units of blood and 12 units of plasma, and that was the whole unmatched blood stock at the Port Lincoln Hospital. Oh. And luckily after that, I... Um, I was stable enough to be transported from the Port Lincoln footy over where they stopped the footy match and they got me in a helicopter and they started that trek to, to Adelaide. And, and in that flight, I started the hemorrhage again and I'll, my blood pressure got down to like 60 systole or something like that. Um, and they used all the blood in the helicopter and they had to have someone waiting with a bag of blood at the helipad when I got there. Cause they almost lost me again. So you know, almost, almost, it was almost my time a few times. So someone yeah. was looking down on you on that day, which is, which oh is great. yeah, yeah, yeah. So very, very lucky. And how long were you in hospital when you got to, got to Adelaide? 
I was rushed straight into emergency surgery. Um, and then they stitched up my initial bite mark. They couldn't stitch up the stump at that time because I was too unstable. But then they put me in induced coma for 10 days. And then in that time, they tried to wake me a couple of times, but I wasn't showing enough signs. But also in that time, I went into complete renal failure. And that was due to the sustained CPR and massive blood loss. So all my organs were shutting down. I swelled up. I went yellow. And, um, yeah, it wasn't looking good in those first eight, 10 days. And, um, but luckily for me, that 10 days later, I woke from a coma. I didn't have any brain damage, which is what my family pretty much told that I was definitely going to have. So that was a <laughs> positive yeah. and I was stoked to hear that. And then I slowly started to get better over those next couple of weeks. And then I think I was in ICU for maybe two or three weeks. And then, and then I was moved to the trauma ward where it didn't really work out for me because I needed that renal care and that, um, my constant dialysis um, to flush out my kidneys that weren't working. And then I moved to the, yeah, I moved to the renal ward and, and that's where things started to get better. And I think I was only in hospital for about eight weeks. And and the recovery process, uh, lots of rehab, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So once I was out of hospital, it was um, the rehab, rehab side of things and getting myself ready to use a prosthetic, um, which had to wait a little bit because I, my initial bite mark on my hip, um, all those wounds opened up when I stood up because of the kidney failure. Um, so they all popped open and they those wounds had to heal from the inside out. And so that slowed that healing process down. So I wasn't allowed to wear a prosthetic for a, a, quite a few weeks. So when I finally got that opportunity to stand in a prosthetic, it was, yeah, pretty exciting. And I saw you walking in today. We had a bit of a joke about it before. It was like, um, it looked like, I, you know, I used to be on a Sunday morning after copying a corky the night before uh, during a game of footy or something like that. You, you're walking pretty well. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my socket's fitting well. You wouldn't even be able to tell that I have a prosthetic with pants on. Um, yeah, it's it just goes, you know, I can have the best leg in the world, but if I don't have a comfortable socket, then it doesn't matter. So it's all about getting that, that socket comfortable and I can walk as good as anyone else. And we also talked about something off air before, right? The Olympics is obviously going gangbusters around the world at the moment and, and surfing's been, been one of the big sports and you're obviously a bit of a gun at surfing. Yeah. How good would it be to be competing for Australia in the Paralympics in the sport of surfing one day? Oh, it'd be epic. I mean, if they, we just need them to, you know, I know the surfing's in the Olympics and I think that, you know, I think people were quite interested in it. There was, you know, the coverage of the Olympics was quite good this year. There was some skating, surfing, stuff that you wouldn't normally see. Um, like, you know, it's normally track and field and swimming. So I think hopefully some positives come out of it and they might decide to put the Paralympic surfing in the next Olympics, which would be good. And yeah, there's definitely, there's plenty of people around the world, um, that, that are doing it these days, you know, surfers with one leg and stuff like that. So there's definitely people there that would be keen. And what a story that would be as well. I can just imagine Channel 7 just eating it up. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> Shark Tuck Survivor, now a, a champion surfer in Paralympics. Wouldn't that just be awesome? Yeah, it'd be awesome, yeah. <laughs> Winning yeah. gold for Australia. Yeah, Fingers yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> and, yeah. and that first time we got back in the water, um, tell us about that feeling, Chris. Uh, obviously, there would have been a lot of nerves there. When was this and, and where was the first surfing spot you went to? I think it took me 12 months to, to build up the courage to go back in um, and... I sort of just put push surfing aside in that 12 months. I didn't want to know about it. I didn't want to, because I, I was a big follower of the surfing um, and the WCL and that sort of stuff. And I just completely lost interest in it for that 12 months. And I refused to go um, with mates and even watch, you know. But I started to get that itch for, you know, about 12 months later. And I started looking around. And the biggest thing was being an above knee amputee is being able to being able to lower your center of gravity and, and, and I don't have that movement with your knee or your ankle. So, um, getting up on a board is quite hard. Um, so, and, I, and there's no legs for it that, that, that the prosthetic, you know, Otterbock, the companies that don't make a surfing leg. So I had to design something myself and it's literally just an angle adapter on the foot onto a, an aluminum pylon into another adapter, which, which creates your socket sitting back that way. And that creates that sort of mimics you standing in that crouch position, which is what you need with surfing. And that's what I needed. You know, I, I went I first surf back. I surfed with um, a couple of the guys that actually pulled me from the water and um, it took me a few goes. I fell off a lot, but I knew that I'd get it eventually. Once I got up that first time, I've, I've just come leaps and bounds since there. And do you still, no doubt you still have that bit of fear. We, we spoke about this before as well. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a wuss when it comes to sharks, a lot, as a lot of people are. And I remember seeing fins in the water one time. My mates gave me crap about it, but it was actually dolphins. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, they sneak um, up on you. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, so 
no doubt there'd be those sort of fears still in the back of your mind and, and when you see situations and things like that. So tell us more about that. Yeah, it's, it's you know, that's, that's the hardest thing. Overcoming, you know, I probably went through the most traumatic experience you could have. Um, and that's something that all people when living in Australia on the coast that use the ocean fear is being attacked by sharks. So um, I just had to slowly build myself back up to that. And um, just, yeah, once I, I, I used to tend to sh- shorten my surf and just do a little surf. I used to um, breathing techniques to try and lower my anxiety before I went into the water. And then also just, I just checked, you know, you, the statistics of being attacked by a shark, a shark, a great white shark is like one in three million. So you just remind myself of that. <laughs> and then um, if it was, if the weather was like the day I was attacked where it was really wet and gloomy and the water visibility was bad, I tend not to surf. Um, and then once I, it was just, just experience. So once you just did it a few times and slowly built up that, you just got used to it. I mean, there's still times when I get a little bit uneasy in the water and there's certain things that make, you know, I could become all hypersensitive to movements and stuff like that. And that's probably due to the trauma that re- remind me of the attack. But I just try and calm myself down in the water and, and know that, you know, it's not happening and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's just, it's an ongoing battle. And I'm going to be re- physically and mentally covering for the, this trauma for the rest of my life but it's just something that i've learned to live with and and there's just processes that i have in place that help me do that has it come to make you respect sharks more as well and would you actually do cage diving because a lot of people say that's a an interesting way of obviously it's a bit a bit of a freaky way of doing it but it's also also a way of just appreciating how amazing these animals are yeah i've thought about doing it um but yeah i just i'm not i think i'm ready to put myself in that situation yet um but if the, if the opportunity comes up, I'd, I'd consider it, but I'm, I'm not at that point yet. I don't think just, yeah, slowly easy into it. I don't really need to do it. Um, but if someone offered me to do it, then I probably, probably would consider it. Yeah. And you had a fair bit of trouble trying to get the tooth back from the great white because of the, the situation in terms of the rules with, with environment protection and what have you. But yep. the great news is that you finally got that. I finally got it. Yeah. yeah. Is there enough? Fair enough. Though, you know, they, they drop teeth all the time and people find them on the beach. It just seems a bit silly. I think, you know, the, the police did the right thing. You know, it was stuck in my board, um, you know, but my board washed up on the beach with my leg um, still attached. So they, they got a bit of shock there. And then, yeah, they obviously, then they grabbed the board and there was a tooth underneath the boards stuck in the board. And, and um, yeah, they obviously knowing they're a protected species, they thought they'd better do the right thing, hand it into the fisheries. And then once the fisheries had it, that was, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you got, got the result that you wanted in the end, most importantly. Yeah, so. I don't see why, you know, I'm not going to do anything bad with it. It's just um, it's a good souvenir to have, you know, to show yeah. my kids and stuff like that. So. And the tooth is just phenomenal, isn't it, as well? It just, yeah. Again, it just makes you really appreciate the, the size of these animals and, yeah, and yeah. they're just such beasts. Yeah, and just um, like you can see the damage on the tooth when it went into the board. and It's just interesting to look at. And I haven't had... It'd be good to get trying to get some data from it and, and see, you know, what the size of the shark was and stuff like that. But I just haven't got around to it. And going forward, you've, uh, you've started doing some motivational speaking, which is wonderful. Um, how can people get you for, for speaking gigs and, uh, yeah, how they find out more about Chris Blows? Yeah, so obviously I've released a book. Um, and then since then I've started getting to the motivational speaking. And if you're interested, then well, I have a website, chrisblows.com.au, and you can contact us by email. Um, and yeah, go from there. Wonderful. It's um, so good that you've, um, number one, that you've actually uh, survived such a horrible situation, but number two, that you're actually out there surfing and, and able to speak about it. And, you know, people can hear your story, Chris. So that's incredible. And, and yeah, if yeah. You help anyone in any way, then yeah, I don't mind sharing it at all. So I think people get a lot from it. You know, I don't think too much of it, but people seem to like hearing the story. You know, it's a crazy story. And then, um, you know, just about overcoming adversity and and that mindset that I had to put myself in to be able to overcome that adversity. Yeah. So, and the book Caught Inside is it available as an audio book as well? Uh not not an audio book yet. No. I get a lot of people <laughs> asking me that. All my mates that can't read. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe down the track. But yeah, it's just a paperback at the moment. And we can get it at all, all bookstores, or uh, you can get it at Dylan's Bookshop Nord, or the best way to be buy online on, on our website. So yep. Caught Inside. Yep. Absolute ripper. 
Hey, um, Chris Blows, thanks so much for joining us today on Legends of Bevo Live. It's um, no worries, thanks for me, mate. Um, it's been absolute pleasure, and, and like I said before, you're an inspiration, and, and I really hope going forward that you continue your great things with your motivational speaking, and and yeah, hopefully you deserve it to uh, compete for Australia one day in surfing if, if it comes in the uh, Paralympics. So yeah, yeah, nah, cool. I hope so as well. Keep up the great work, mate, and uh, speak cheers. again soon. Thank you.